sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at GBNews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, this weekend sees the four year anniversary of the first COVID lockdown. We're still paying the price for that madness. Never again. My Mark Meets guest is the legendary US politician Bob McEwen, whose traditional conservative views led him to be described as a textbook Republican. He'll be talking to me about Joe Biden, Donald Trump and the race for the White House. One of America's politics' most colorful figures, he joins me before the end of the hour. In the big story, do the tragic events of the last couple of days remind us just how loved and important our royal family are? I'll be joined in the studio by one of the country's leading royal authors. And in my take at 10, Sir Keir Starmer is to hand more power to the unions with even Blairite mastermind Peter Mandelson worrying it will hurt businesses. Can Britain afford a Labour government? I'll be dealing with Sir Keir Starmer in no uncertain terms. Two hours of big opinion, big debate and big entertainment. Lots to get through. First, the news headlines and Sam Francis. Mark, thanks very much and a very good evening to you. It's just gone nine o'clock. We start with news coming to us from Moscow tonight that two suspects in Friday's deadly shooting 
at a concert hall have been charged in court with an act of terrorism. Earlier footage from the Russian capital showed four suspects being taken into custody following that terror incident, which we now know has claimed at least 130 lives. The Islamic State terror group has claimed responsibility for the attack. However, Russia is continuing to link Ukraine, an allegation that Kyiv has denied. Tonight, Russian security officials have published another statement saying they will hunt down and kill those who masterminded the attack. Meanwhile, Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive. That's according to the Defence Secretary here in the UK. After a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol, this was the moment that two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and struck. Security sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike. And we understand a major military communication centre was also damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far, as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Simon Harris has been confirmed as the new leader of the Fine Gael party, paving the way for him to become Ireland's youngest premier. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday of this week for what he described as personal and political reasons. Mr Harris is expected to become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach after the Easter recess. He said today that politics should be a force for good. Hope, enterprise, equality of opportunity, integrity and security. I have been in this party since I was 15 years old. And those values mean and meant everything to me, because I believe in public service. I believe in the power of politics to make a difference. I believe that politics as a profession can make people's lives better. Government lawyers working from home have reportedly spent nearly £4 million of taxpayers' money on new laptops, tablets and mobile phones. According to reports in The Telegraph, the government legal department has purchased thousands of remote working devices since 2021, including 560 mobile phones, more than 2,000 new laptops and multiple tablet computers. Those figures come as ministers are pushing to have Whitehall staff back in the office at least 60% of the time, amid concerns over reduced productivity due to remote working. In London today, the British Museum was forced to close as hundreds of pro-Palestine and environmental protesters gathered outside. Activists were seen waving banners and Palestinian flags and shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine say they will keep targeting the museum until it ends its £50 million partnership with the oil giant BP. And if you've ever complained about slow service in a cafe or restaurant, well, your waiter may be able to get to your table slightly quicker than they're letting on. Today, hundreds of apron service staff surged through the streets of Paris in the cafe waiters race. Contestants had to carry a classic French breakfast of coffee, pastry and a glass of water with just one hand and, importantly, not spill a single drop. The race was first held in 1914 when waiters who took part in that challenge had to take on a much longer route of five miles. Those are the latest headlines. I'll be back in the next hour. Up next, it's over to Mark for more. In the meantime, you can scan the QR code on your screen or go to our website to get all the latest and breaking news. Thanks, Sam. Welcome to a very busy Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, this weekend sees the four-year anniversary of the first COVID lockdown. We're still paying the price for that madness never again. In the big story, do the tragic events of the last couple of days remind us just how loved and important our royal family are? I'll be joined in the studio by one of the country's leading and most fearless royal commentators. My Mark Meets guest is the legendary US politician Bob McEwen, whose traditional conservative views led him to be described as a textbook Republican. We'll be talking Biden, Trump and the race for the White House. In my take at 10, Sakia Starmer is to hand more power to the unions, with even Blairite mastermind Peter Mandelson worrying that it will hurt businesses. Can Britain afford 
a Labour government. I'll be dealing with Sakir Sama in no uncertain terms at 10. Plus, are Reform UK a far-right party? And is the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt right to say that £100,000 is not a huge salary? I'll be asking former government minister Anne Whittacombe. And we've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 sharp with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say, who don't follow the script and normally don't agree with me. The leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton. Former Labour special advisor, Paul Richards. And journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee. And tonight I'll be asking my pundits, are too many people using mental health to get out of doing a day's work? We'll also be joined by a top author who's written at length on that very subject. Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come. I'll be dealing with Keir Starmer at 10. <laughs> you won't want to miss it. But first, my big opinion. Now, I always get in trouble with Mrs Dolan for forgetting our wedding anniversary. Which absent-minded bloke hasn't found himself at an all-night garage in the dead of night purchasing an anemic bunch of daffodils to repair the damage? Well, this week sees an anniversary that we would all like to forget. Because this week it is four years since Boris Johnson, under the mesmeric spell of sage scientists, announced the first national lockdown. The UK actually had a pandemic plan in place, which we swiftly discarded and instead followed the lead, quite amazingly, of the Chinese Communist Party by locking people in their homes. No data to back this up, no science. In fact, the only country in Europe that did adopt the established British pandemic plan was Sweden who had no mask mandates, they kept businesses and schools open. They functioned normally. And of course, they suffered a fraction of the health, economic and societal damage. And would you believe it? They boast the lowest excess deaths in Europe from 2020 to 2023, even beating their Scandinavian neighbours. Four years on, the damage to our country and our society has been incalculable. It's been unlimited and it will be lasting. This wild experiment of locking people up in their homes but letting everyone go to Tesco for an hour a day, make it make sense, has destroyed our economy, closed once viable businesses, left us with £2.6 trillion worth of debt, a mental health tsunami, an NHS waiting list of almost 8 million people, an angrier, more divided society, an epidemic of worklessness, and a generation of damaged kids. And what for? What for? A nasty new virus, yes, which took too many from us, but which was described by Sweden's chief medic as the most age-specific virus he'd ever seen. In fact, the average age of death from uh, COVID or with COVID, of course, that's another conversation, was over 80, which is actually higher than the average life expectancy in this country. A virus so deadly, a third had no symptoms, and a virus for which the authorities told us we had to pretend that we had. Do you remember the ad campaign? Act like you've got it. Make it make sense. A disease so bad we had to keep endlessly testing to find out whether we had it. We did all of this to stop a nasty respiratory virus. Given that they spent decades trying to find a cure for the common cold, this move was optimistic, to say the least, if not misguided and, frankly, insane. How unfortunate that this madness was authorised and administered by top government scientists. Remember that expression, follow the science? Well, just the word science now is something that many people hold in contempt, given what was done in its name over three dreadful years. And as far as I'm concerned, expert is now a four-letter word. There were a few voices of dissent, some brave and brilliant journalists, around 100 heroic Tory MPs who voted against the second and third lockdowns. A few scientists spoke out, the ones that weren't censored, labelled granny killers or given the sack. 
and even I tried to do my bit on my little drive time show on talk radio, in which I spent months warning about the economic and societal damage of lockdowns. Now, I famously chopped up a mask live on air, which led to a viral video watched by tens of millions of people and reported on around the world. Here is the moment. If you want to save lives and get the country back on track, the only option is to get back to normal. And the first step to achieving that is to get rid of these wretched, god-awful, damned, blinking, uncomfortable, scientifically empty, useless masks. I've never been one to sit on the fence. Uh, given that the COVID inquiry this week heard that those filthy, environmentally catastrophic face rags had, and I quote, a near non-existent benefit, then my little on-air rant appears to have aged better than Sophia Loren. There really is no end to this. The Nightingale hospitals, remember them? Well, they cost millions, but they stayed empty, serving as monuments to an utterly failed policy. 34 billion, that's right, 34 billion on the pathetic test and trace system that tracked us like something out of 1984. The madness continued unchecked, unabated for years. And now Sky News, who, like so much of establishment media, failed to deploy any critical judgment or any attempts to widen the debate about these unprecedented measures gleefully announced this week that there is another pandemic around the corner. Hooray! We can look forward to that. Well, next time that happens, you know where you can stick your masks and your lockdowns. But just to be on the safe side, I've kept the scissors. You never know when they might come in handy. Chop, chop. Now, the government and the government's health advisers are very clear that lockdowns, mask mandates, vaccine mandates saved countless lives and stopped the NHS from being overwhelmed. That is not my view. I think it was the worst public health mistake in history. Let me know your thoughts, mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly. But first, tonight's top pundits. I'm delighted to have in the studio the leader of UKIP, no less, Neil Hamilton. Uh, we also have former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards and communications advisor and journalist, the one and only Linda Jubilee. Great to see all three of you here in the studio. Uh, Linda, four years since lockdowns, never again. Well, I made myself quite unpopular with some of my friends by questioning the necessity for a lockdown, mm. I must admit. But I spoke to many healthcare professionals afterwards and they explained to me that a lockdown is a very blunt instrument. It is used once in the first instance to protect NHS resources and to gauge the nature of the first wave. What I do question much more is the necessity for the subsequent lockdowns. Having said that, I mean, um, I, I really believed in what Sweden was doing, and I said so to many people. Their effort was led by an epidemiologist who was a veteran of the Ebola outbreak in mm. West Africa, and I do believe that he did know what he was and doing. And he was working from the British pre-pandemic plan. Yes, he, he, and, and, and he really really spoke a lot of sense, I think. I mean, I can remember being a foreign correspondent in Hong Kong when we had bird flu. We had an outbreak of bird flu mm. and the authorities there had to kill just over a million chickens in 48 hours. So I'm not... And that's because they were the spreaders. Yeah. I'm not saying that drastic action shouldn't be taken. It should be taken because we knew in Hong Kong at the time we prevented a pandemic mm. that time round and we knew one was coming and it did. Sometimes you just have to put that blunt instrument in full but you shouldn't keep repeating it. That's my view. Well, I'd like to have seen no action, Paul Richards, because we now have an NHS waiting list of 7 million people, a completely destroyed economy, an enormous national debt and a generation of damaged kids. But all of those things are down to the government, not to do with COVID. And it, without uh, the lockdown, it's entirely possible the NHS wouldn't even be there today to, to worry about because it would have fallen over. Lots of people were going to work. The key workers were going to work. It wasn't everyone that was locked down, just people that could happily not be there in an office somewhere. Uh, and the, it is demonstrably true that it has saved an awful lot of lives for people watching this tonight who wouldn't be is here Sweden otherwise. not the so, elephant in the room? But the different nations do different. They have different cultures, different economies. They do different things. So 
So, you know, I think... But we, wouldn't we, 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 we think that we, Sweden, we, with no lockdowns and no mask Mark, mandates, we, surely they should perform disproportionately badly. They've got the lowest excess deaths in Europe. They even beat their Scandinavian neighbours. Well, they've got a much stronger health service because of it being the, social the democratic. Norway, or the Norway, the but, you know, Denmark, we, The problem the is, I think, that at the time, the decision-makers, and this was a Conservative government, I'm no sure. fan of those. No, you're absolutely we, right. We just didn't know, did we? And I think they did the best they could with the evidence. Well, I'll give you something. I think Boris Johnson was absolutely the worst person to have in charge during the pandemic. Yes, well, that's oh, what's yeah. coming out, isn't and it? And I will give you that. Uh, and I'll give you that times panic, 100. It would seem. Uh, Neil Hamilton, your thoughts? Well, I voted against all these measures when I was a member of the Welsh Parliament. Right from the start, I denounced this as an authoritarian reaction that was bound to fail. In fact, I described it as a sledgehammer to miss a nut, which is exactly what happened. Uh, undoubtedly, the lockdowns made the health problems that we were going to suffer far worse than they would otherwise have been. The first thing that was done, of course, was to turf out all the old people, the most vulnerable, from hospitals and stuff them into nursing homes mm. and without knowing whether they had the virus or not. Mm. So that mm. created a massive spike mm. in the uh, uh, deaths and uh, severe complications from COVID amongst the most vulnerable part of the population. It was actually an utterly irrational policy. And it's just living proof, or in, in fact, dying proof, actually, <laughs> in the way, that, that uh, you know, authoritarian solutions are never a solution. They are the problem. And government is almost never the answer. It's yeah, but you've got, to be, you've, got to, you've got to be measured. When, when those doctors told me that a lockdown, and actually it's quite close to the phrase you used, is a blunt instrument, they mean you have to do it in the first instance to actually protect your resources and measure the wave. You don't need to do it again, but it's not, a, it's not wrong but to do it the first time around. three weeks to flatten the curve to turn out to be a big, fat lie. Well, just on it? that point about the state, right, mm. the state intervention that worked the best was the vaccination programme, and that was the NHS delivering mm. a, a massive public health benefit to us all, which we now get back to work. And that wasn't the private sector, that was the state doing it. OK. That, so, well, know. folks, uh, let me say, thank God it was four years ago, never again. Uh, next up in the big story, do the tragic events of the last couple of days remind us just how loved and important our royal family are? I'll be joined in the studio by one of the country's leading royal authors next. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. This is Louis Walsh, and if you're watching this year's series of Celebrity Big Brother, you will, you will know uh, what Louis Walsh has been talking about. It is the fact that he's been di diagnosed, or he's had a battle, with a rare blood cancer, and nobody knew anything about it, Joanna. Yeah, I mean, um, we all kind of remember Louis, don't we, from um, X Factor, and he's a very much loved character. Mm. Louis always used to be the one that would kind of take all the kooky acts and all the quirky mm. ones. Obviously, it's incredibly brave for him to actually share something so private um, about this diagnosis that he had. Um, but also, you know, when things like this happen with people who are public figures, it also brings a lot of awareness, and a lot of people have been watching Big Brother. We're obviously talking about it now, when this is the type of blood cancer that I'd never heard about. I mean, it is incredible, isn't it, really, what it would do to raise awareness for people? For sure. And I think it's really important because I think quite often people watch these programmes and it can be a little bit silly and mm -hmm. arguments and stuff. But actually, when someone that's got a lot of media attention, like Louis Walsh, mm -hmm. talks about this, a lot of people start mm -hmm. to think, you know, cancer research do a lot of good work. I'm not shocked that he's doing that. He's, he's a very Marmite figure, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen what Jedward have been saying about Lou Walsh behind the scenes, you mm. know. He's a very kind of, a lot of people say he's quite a nasty figure. Oh. You know, he's been in the show business a long time. He knows how to get certain people to do certain things. And I think he's, um, he's great for the programme, though, because, you know, that's what we want, right? We want reality TV to be exactly how it is, you know. Mm. Yeah. That's actually one I'm thing scared. that I've I thought in terms of casting for Celebrity Big Brother, they did a really good job yeah, in getting Sharon and Louis, Louis in there. We're getting all the Hollywood gossip, yeah. you know, who they like, who they don't like, and I think Simon that's been the other great. Day. That was good, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is he a colourful character? Colourful, yes. That's how you But just... when you said he's like Marmite, you've got to think, you can put a bit of Marmite in your bolognese and it tastes good.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'll get to your emails shortly, but it's time now for the big story. And do the tragic events of the last couple of days remind us just how loved and important our royal family are? Well, let's get the views of leading royal author and journalist Angela Levin. Angela, lovely to see you in the studio. Nice to be here. Um, the outpouring of public sympathy for the family at this difficult time speaks volumes, doesn't it? Yes, it's amazing. It's come from all around the world. And, yeah. you know, taxi drivers have been crying it, you know, not being able to drive. I cried when I spoke about it yesterday. I mean, yeah. but it wasn't... It was, of course, very important for Catherine, but actually mm. it was for the whole royal family. Yeah. They wanted it to still keep going. Um, and for the king as well. I mean, we just saw someone realising what a wonderful situation we have here yes. and how everybody respects the royal family. Mm. Um, 15 million people come every year just to see Buckingham Palace. I mean, it is just amazing. And they were, everyone is interested in what's going on. Most definitely. And this is a monarchy that is far from irrelevant, isn't it? it? It remains central to the British way of life. That's what we've been reminded of in the last few days. Yes, and I think it also because it's very stable. Mm. We know where we are with them. And we actually see people who are full of being giving and not taking, yeah. encouraging you to be a good with charities and to behave well, I feel. Yeah. Um, they set an example. There's always one or two black sheep in, in the way, but I think they are. And all it costs us, each of us, is £1.29 a year. And so people who grumble about it, mm. um, I think, are completely wrong because we have the most wonderful events and the most wonderful understanding of people giving or being devout about what they want to do. And, and it's interesting how you created this sense in that last answer that there's a permanence to the royal family, yes. that they are a constant. Yes. And, of course, when that's interrupted or threatened, such as, of course, the passing of Queen Elizabeth, uh, or, indeed, health news regarding King Charles or, indeed, his daughter-in-law, then that really troubles people. Very much so, to the core, actually. Yeah. Because it is unique and it's wonderful and it, it gives so much help to people. It's mm. a sort of tangent to your own family. Yeah. You, you, you see people when they're little, when they grow up, when they get married, when they become ill, when they, you know, it's all all in a sort of family situation, and I think it does us all a lot of good, and we we enjoy it. I think it's very important, actually. The, the royal family are our family, and that's why we yes. take this news very personally. Yes, absolutely, it yeah. is, and you you want to go and see it when there's the the um, special days, and you want to actually be part of it. Uh, what about King Charles and, and what he's going through at the moment? It's so easy to forget that he's fighting his own cancer battle. Uh, you've written at length about the family and about Charles. Um, do you feel that he is physically and mentally equipped for what he's going through at the moment? I think he's a very determined man. He's wanted to be king for a very, very long time. Mm. I mean, to wait till you're 73 is a long time, actually, to, to take the, the crown. Um, I think, obviously, at his age, it's very difficult, but he's very determined and he's only really just started to be king mm. and he wants to move on. And supporting him 
very much absolutely by his side is Queen Camilla, yeah. who is going to his the all the engagements that they would have gone to together on her own, mm. except the ones that would have been especially his. And so that way he will feel it's still moving, it's still running, and they can discuss it and talk about it. And I think that's marvellous. I mean, she is holding the royal family up and being strong. If you imagine that, you know, 30 years ago, people were saying if, you know, what would happen to her, that the whole royal family would absolutely disintegrate and she would be of no use and um, you couldn't even look at her because of she's not been a virgin when she married the king, um, the then prince. Yeah. And, I, and I think, well, there we are. You know, you really never know what people are going to do. But she's a wonderful woman and she's just doing it very quietly. She told me that she doesn't like being in the spotlight. Mm. She's not in the spotlight, but she's there and she's very accessible and she makes people laugh and she's very caring. And she's chosen charities as well that are um, that the royal family wouldn't have chosen, like domestic violence and, and, and rape and all those things, which actually expand what they can do and which she can really have a strong power in. And, and Charles, as the head of the family, needs his wife more than ever, not just for the important public role that she's playing, but to support him. Yes. Uh, to support her husband. She understands him very well because they've been together for a fif over 50 years before they even got married, so, you know, it's a long time. Um, they make each other laugh, they have the same sense of humour, they understand each other. And if you see them when they're out, they move together. It's in, very in interesting. Tandem. Yes. And um, I think he would be so delighted that she's there and um, is kind and knows how to look after him, cheer him up and make sure he's OK. Uh, would you like to see other figures like Princess Anne and Prince Edward upgraded to a more frontline role? Well, I think Princess Anne is always ready for a frontline role. Mm. I think she did when we saw that in the coronation, that she was um, there on her horse and guarding the new king. And that was a very important job right there, to look after him. Um, I think she's willing to do everything, but she really doesn't like the press to follow her. She doesn't like to be, um, a, a, again, the centre of attra attraction. But she will do anything. She'll do anything for her brother. Mm. I mean, she can be relied on. And I think the, the public like her very much indeed, because she's just no nonsense woman, you know. And I think Edward and his wife, Sophie, I think Sophie is, does far more than Edward, but I think the pair of them can do everything. The Queen once said about um, Sophie that she's marvellous because when she's in the room, you don't even know she's there. She mm. just gets on with things. And although it doesn't sound particularly polite, it's actually very important that she does actually do so much work. She's taking on loads just to be helpful and to be part of the family. Angela, briefly, uh, do you think the family will be changed by this? Of course, we pray for a speedy recovery for both Princess Catherine and the King as well. And, by the way, I should add Sarah Ferguson, who had a cancer diagnosis. Um, do you think that, please God, when they prevail over these medical issues, that the family will be different somehow? Well, I think um, Catherine will do a lot with people who've had cancer. She'll be able to help them yeah. because she will understand. But I think she and the King have got close. Um, William has got closer to his father and to Camilla. Mm. Um, don't forget that she was the number three in, in the family, um, Diana said. And I think that they will be very close together and really respect each other and um, work very hard as, as much as they can to help this country and the Commonwealth. Angela, I always love watching you on Saturday afternoons with my <laughs> hero, Nana Aquia. And I think you're back on Breakfast on Tuesday, aren't you? Yes, I am. So, brilliant stuff. My thanks to uh, leading royal biographer and journalist, Angela Levin. Now, next up, Government Minister Mel Stride sparked a backlash after claiming mental health culture has gone too far. So whilst this issue is a serious one, are too many people using mental health to get out of doing a day's work? We'll debate that next. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quiet today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday. 
but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and it will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period, some of that rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Well, a big response to my conversation with Angela Levin about how the tragic news of the last couple of days has reminded all of us just how much we love and need our royal family. Uh, this from Mark, who says, Angela Levin, a lovely lady, is spot on, with Edward and Sophie bolstering the numbers. Uh, given Andrew is still not working, this would be a good plan. James says, Mark, great discussion. We love William and Catherine and their lovely children and pray for them, as we did for Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip before, we like King Charles, but disagree with him about the international climate hoax. Yours sincerely, Jim. Uh, Jim, you're entitled to your view. Of course, the majority of uh, scientists do believe that uh, the planet is heating up and needs to be dealt with, but you're absolutely welcome uh, to share your thoughts and keep them coming. Mark at gbnews.com. Why is that? Well, because Mark Dolan tonight is the home of diverse opinion and no one gets cancelled, not on my watch. I just won't have it. Uh, one last email, and it's somebody that disagrees with me very strongly, and it is John. Good evening, John. How are you? That was my grandfather's name. John says to me, Hi, Mark, I'd like to tell you how I totally disagree with your rant this evening regarding the anniversary of the COVID lockdown. Yes, with hindsight, the action taken may have been handled better, but we were on the threshold of an unknown virus with the, all the uncertainties that the country faced. Um, it's a long and brilliant email. I wish I had more time for it, but John, thank you for uh, offering your view, which counters mine. OK, lots more to come. Keep those emails coming. Don't forget, in about 25 minutes' time, I'll be dealing with Sir Keir Starmer in no uncertain terms, and it's about the fact that the Labour government will give the unions more power. But first, the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride has been criticised for saying that normal ups and downs of life are being medicalised amid concern about the effects of ill health on the economy. He said that the culture of mental health has now gone too far and argued that it's vital to have an honest debate about the causes of soaring levels of mental illness and the impact that they're having on the benefits bill. Well, let me read you 
some statistics. There are now a record 2.7 million people off work with long-term illness, and the cost of sickness benefits for those of working age is projected to rise from £41 billion a year to £69 billion a year before the end of the decade. Figures last week showed that two-thirds of incapacity benefit claims cited mental health with 20,000 people a month being deemed incapable of working as a result. So whilst a deadly serious issue, is mental health being used by some to avoid doing a day's work? Let's speak to Beverly Thompson. Beverly Thompson is the author of Antidepressed, a breakthrough examination of epidemic antidepressant harm and dependence. Beverly, great to have you on the show. Plenty of people have real mental health issues and they should seek professional help if they do. But is mental health being exploited by some to game the benefit system? Hi, Mark, good to see you. Um, I guess one of the questions that was asked following um, the article uh, was, um, you know, do we have a mental health benefits racket? And that is one question that many people started to to, to, to ask, and um, the answer might be yes. You know, our, obsess our obsession with mental health has probably gone too far, but it's a much more complex issue than one that can be solved by getting people back to work. You know, why do we have such a lar large section of society now who feel they're unable to work? You know, the Department of Work and Pensions data shows us that poor mental health is now the leading cause of disability among working age adults. And perhaps Mel Stride should start by asking, why is this? You know, why have we become mental health obsessed? Why are we finding it difficult to cope with life? And why do we feel unable to work? And I guess once he's addressed the real underlying issues that lead to so many of us finding life difficult, mm. he might then be better able to address the issue of getting people back to work. Is it because mental health has become a cult, a religion, which is being preached at school and beyond? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been told for quite some time that mental health deserves parity with our physical health. But, you know, now I suppose the pendulum really has swung too far. We need a system that's based on compassion. We are, after all, human. But we need to understand that as much as it's good to be open about how we feel about life, and about our ability to cope with life, we need to understand that the issue is usually not a biological illness. I think a better... Yeah. Beverly, I'm sorry, better, g finish your point, please. Yeah, I think a better understanding of this might help people realise that the problem does not lie with them, their mm. illness, their inability to cope with life. I cannot stress enough, and I know you'll agree, that if I've got viewers watching this show or listening to the programme, who are seriously depressed, they want to take their life, they're not happy, they must reach out for help. You've got Samaritans, you've got your GP. Do it, do it, do it. Um, that's very important. Male suicide, for example, is an epidemic and an absolute tragedy. So we take mental health seriously, but it's those that are perhaps capitalising uh, on its advantages. And Beverly, it does seem odd, doesn't it, that we have prevailed as a species for thousands of years through famine, natural disaster, pestilence, and war, life has never been comfortable or easy, and yet now this generation are having a particular problem with mental health. What's going on? Well, I think that, you know, it's mental health has, has become a real social media issue. Um, we have been told for a long time, as you say, to seek help with our mental health, and rightly so. As you say, if we are in trouble, if we need mm. help, we should look for it. But nowadays we're being encouraged by a host of celebrities and influencers and they conveniently support this, you know, unsubstantiated biological based explanation of mental illness. Mm. We're told to tell our stories, to get help. Um, but really, we're being persuaded into buying into the medical model of mental health because it makes things easier for those who could make changes, changes to social conditions to get away with things, I suppose. And it makes money. It's the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I do have friends and colleagues that say if they didn't have their meds, they wouldn't be here. So I take that very seriously. But there is an industry that makes money from flogging pills 
through the yeah. NHS. And that's what your book is all about. Uh, stay with me, Beverly, because let me bring in my top pundits, if I can. Paul Richards, Linda Jubilee and Neil Hamilton uh, to discuss this issue. Uh, Paul, do you think some people are gaming the system when it comes to mental health? No, I think we have an absolute epidemic in this country of mental health illness. I think it's a, a crisis. And the underfunding, underfunding of the system means that people can't get the treatment they need. And young people in particular can't get access to CAMS. Uh, and if you've got any kind of problem, you know, you are being told to stay at home, but you need proper treatment, talking therapies, maybe even pharmaceuticals as well. But if to be taken seriously by the NHS, you know, long ago we said we'd have parity of esteem between both physical and mental health, and we're nowhere near that now. But, but, but why is this epidemic happening? You know, in the 1930s, German bombs reigned over London, Coventry, Liverpool and beyond. You know, we were at war. Yes, Hitler we... was rampaging across Europe. There was no mental health crisis. Yes, there, there was. was. There was an enormous mental health crisis, but it was all hushed up. That post-war generation had a range of problems that were all hushed up, and people just... Within families, it was taboo. People didn't talk about it. There was no treatment. People were treated abysmally. If they were really ill, they were shoved into asylums and hidden away for the soldiers, on end. The soldiers, perhaps, I take your point about post-traumatic stress disorder from the, the war heroes of the First and Second World War. But as a society, you know, we faced extinction as a nation, and yet people got on with it, Paul. No, I mean, we, we got on with it, but people were unwell and they had all kinds of dysfunction okay. within their family for decades after. Ne it was, OK, it fair, fair enough. Very badly. Fair enough. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, clock's against us. Neil Hamilton, your thoughts? Well, I agree with you, Mark. I mean, what we've done is to breed a snowflake generation. And uh, all, you know, Prince Harry and Meghan are the apogee of all this. You know, uh, the, 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 they have their truths uh, and uh, they, they, they wallow in the, their own psychological misery. Uh, and I, I've had my problems in life. I've you know, lost everything <laughs> financially and had to re remake a fortune again. Uh, and we've had massive stresses as a result of being demonised by the tabloid press on m m many occasions. But you just have to get on with it, toughen up and get through it. Uh, and that sort of attitude, I think, is seen too little today. Yes. Of course, I accept that the, the, there are real uh, mental illnesses, but I do think that because you can't unambiguously prove that somebody's got a mental illness in the way you can prove they've got measles, for example, uh, then it's very easy for people who are unscrupulous to fake their condition, uh, especially if... It makes sense financially to do so. L L Linda, I know, uh, Paul, you're shaking your head. I wish we had longer, but Linda, briefly, if you can, uh, whatever happened to resilience and the stiff upper lip? Life is difficult. I think now that it depends on wh where you come from, what your family's like, what your school's like. I've got three children. They are amongst the most resilient people in my life. I would never describe them as snowflakes, even though one of them had considerable mental health issues in his middle teens. Now the proud owner of two masters in behavioural economics. Um, he pushed his way through it, but he had to have a lot of support. It was very difficult to get him the support. And for three years, we really, really struggled as a family but we came together and we won through. I mean, I think there is an issue here with the worried well and there is some element of medicalising some of these problems, but probably the biggest scandal we have in this country is that we simply don't have the right relevant backup for those people okay. who suffer. OK, uh, Beverly, a couple of seconds or I'll get in trouble with James. Uh, closing thoughts, please. Yeah, I think we have to remember one in three GP appointments now have a mental health component. You know, we don't. We talk about uh, you know a mental health epidemic. Actually, we have depression, anxiety, loneliness, and then now a global mental health pseudo epidemic. The doctor's subjective opinion about our ability to cope with life generally leads to a mental health diagnosis and treatment with drugs primarily antidepressants. And there are no biological tests such as blood tests or brain scans which can be used to provide independent objective data to support any mental health diagnosis. OK, well, look, I know you could say a lot more, but Beverly Thompson is the author of Antidepressed, a breakthrough examination of epidemic antidepressant harm and dependence.
Lots more to get through, folks. Don't forget, in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with Sakir Starmer, who even Peter Mandelson is worried about. Find out why in just 15 minutes' time. But next up, my Mark Meets guest is legendary US politician Bob McEwen, whose traditional conservative views led him to be described as a textbook Republican. He'll be talking Biden, Trump, and the race for the White House next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Can you just let us know if, if there have been people getting into contact with you as a local councillor about how they feel about every lamppost, which is supposed to be public, mm. neutral territory, being covered in these flags? Has it made some of your constituents nervous to walk the streets? It's a complete range of people, including people who are from the Bangladeshi Muslim community who support who support the um, endeavours of what's going of, of Gaza, of what is going on, and are hostile to the actions of the Israeli government, but feel that they shouldn't have these flags on the streets. So if you walk down some of the streets, it doesn't look like a London borough. It looks almost like what you would imagine in Ceausescu's Romania, with flags on every street. Well, well, Peter, can you let us know? Uh, what it's like in the council and their activities in Tower Hamlets. How much time, for example, has been spent discussing issues relating to what's happening in the Middle East? Has it dominated quite a lot of time? No. Um, let's be absolutely fair to the mayor and the administration. There's a heck of a lot to do in this council. We have extremes of deprivation and, um, of course, wealth because of the Clary Wilson city fringe. We have huge problems on the council. And to be fair, the council spends its time doing council matters. And they said initially, in fact, absolutely carefully at council meetings, we can't interfere with foreign policy, but we've got a lot to do on national policy and local policy. Let's concentrate on that. So there hasn't been too much pressure that you can see from people living in the borough for the council to take a stance? Members of the council and the administration have, have um, put their support. As I've said, we're talking of free speech. They're entitled to do that, but it's what happens where the council is responding to absolutely everybody, all 320,000 people who live in our borough. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Coming up in just 10 minutes time, Peter Mandelson, the architect of New Labour, is worried about Sir Keir Starmer. Find out why in my take at 10. But first, Mark Meets. And tonight, one of the most colourful and respected figures in US politics, American lobbyist and former Republican Party politician Bob McEwen. Bob, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Uh, what was it about your upbringing and early years that shaped your political outlook? Well, I grew up in a rural area at a time was not unlike currently. That is, that uh, it seemed in the 1970s the world was falling apart. As you know, we had Callahan and Jimmy Carter and Helmut Schmidt, and just the world was coming to an end any day. Yeah. But lo and behold, with, with Thatcher and Cole and, and Reagan, by the end of the beginning of the 1990s, the world was a different place. And I couldn't understand why the old timers were not as frightened as I was. But what I learned was they'd been through the depression of the 30s and World War II. And now, as I see the chaos in our current leadership, 
I'm optimistic that with the proper thing done at the polls that we can correct all of this. Well, you're absolutely right to say that there are echoes now of the past, the same here in the UK. Uh, you were elected at the age of 24 to the Ohio House of Representatives. That was in 1974, 50 years ago. You're looking good for it. Um, how has America changed since then? Well, it, it uh, has changed in the point that I, they the principles that made America work, uh, the liberals really got into the academic institution mm -hmm. and felt that we could do better. And rather than understanding that the American free enterprise system was the magnet that drew people to America, they said that somehow or another diversity was what our strength was. And that somehow or another, if we took people from areas where the people were escaping and we enculturated with their dynamics into our culture, that that would benefit us, uh, that that would, that would make things better in Europe and the United States. I, I think we're beginning to see that wasn't, isn't so wise. And that, I think that is the most significant difference that I see. Although hasn't America always had diversity in a, in a sense? I mean, my, my family are Irish and half of them went off to uh, Washington uh, in the 1960s, for example. Mark, absolutely. But the significant was that people came to America. There, there, we had the, the lowest, uh, the, 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 we, the weakest uh, underpinning of, of, for poverty. That is, everybody in Europe looked down on America because you had to work or you, or you struggled. And so people came to America to become Americans. And once we began to lift, lift the, 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 the hammock, as we call it, not a safety net, and where people could come to this country and live better sitting on their butt, and they could have a higher standard of living than they had where they came from, and they have their free cell phones and air conditioning and unlimited food stamps and health care, they think, well, why should I work? And that's the distinction between our parents. My mine came from Scotland. I hope we're still friends. Uh, and uh, in the process of becoming American, now they want to still wave their foreign flag and not uh, incorporate the, the American uh, dream. That's what, that's what leadership can change. Reagan changed it, and I believe we can change it as well. Uh, going to America to become Americans, I think that puts it very well. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, Donald Trump will be the Republican candidate in the race for the White House in November. But, Bob, do you have mixed feelings about Trump as the candidate? He's not really a Republican as such, is he? And he's certainly no Ronald Reagan. Well, he's, he's more similar, and if I may say so, Mark, uh, I, I remember those days. I was Reagan's chairman in Ohio in 1976 when we lost by 11 votes in the convention, and then we got Jimmy Carter and Iran and all the rest that goes with it. Yeah. So when he came in in, in, the, in 1980, when he came in during the 80s, he was despised. I remember 500,000 people demonstrating in Paris against this terrible man that was going to blow up the world, Ronald Reagan. I remember 250,000 demonstrating in Berlin, a nation, a city that was surviving because of his generosity. So they, when we say these things about Donald Trump, it's not all that different from what they did about Ronald Reagan. The, mm. the frustration with the left is always that they, they prove to be right. And then when, when America economy took off and when, when the stock market in Beijing fell by 47% after four years of, of, of Donald Trump's leadership, that's what frustrates the big money interests because they don't want to see freedom and free enterprise and, and democracy triumph. They want to have a world global government. And so this is a fight between the World Economic Forum and a man that has the guts to fight it, Donald Trump. Is woke killing America, Bob? It can. We just have to make sure that it doesn't. Mm. And how bad are things on the U.S. border at the moment? I understand that illegal immigration was in excess of three and a half million people last year alone. That's one percent of the population in a year. Every year and, and every month, the population of Dayton, Ohio, uh, comes across the border. It's a deliberate effort by the Democrat Party to change America. Not And whenever you confront them with it, then they always throw up racism as a, and not debate the topic. We don't care about the race of the people. We care about people coming here illegally. Quickly, let me say, you're willing to rent your home to a place, to a person who you know their name and they give you the money up front, mm -hmm. and, and you, you, but you don't walk off and leave the door unlocked because the person that comes in then treats the place entirely different as a squatter. When people come illegally, well, doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs don't come illegally. Because if they do, they can't get the, the licenses and the wherewithal to prosper. And what Donald, what, what Joe Biden has chosen, chosen to do is <clears throat> to allow millions of people, we allow legally more immigrants than the rest of the world combined. 
Now we allow four to five times that to come illegally in the last three years, and the nation is paying a severe price for it. Uh, Bob McEwen, a privilege to have you on the show. Do come back again soon. A fascinating conversation. My thanks to legendary political figure Bob McEwen. Next up, I'll be dealing with Sakir Starmer. Find out why in two. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw it quieter today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday, but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of the rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest, those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times, whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time, before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt, and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, what well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good evening, it's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, Sir Keir Starmer is to hand more power to the unions with even Blairite mastermind Peter Mandelson worrying it will hurt businesses. Can Britain afford a Labour government? I'll be dealing with Sir Keir Starmer in no uncertain terms in two minutes' time. Also, are Reform UK a far-right party? And is the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, right to say that £100,000 is not a huge salary? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, formidable ex-government minister and broadcaster, Anne Widdicombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits, who, let me tell you, are coming in hot. So, a packed show, lots to get through. Hold fire, Keir Starmer in two minutes. I'm not pulling my punches, but first the news headlines and Sam Francis. Mark, thank you very much and good evening to you. It's just gone 10 o'clock and we start with the latest developments uh, from Moscow tonight, where we're now hearing that three suspects in Friday's deadly concert hall shooting have been imprisoned for two months as they await trial and, according to a statement published by the city's district court tonight, the suspects pleaded guilty to charges of terrorism. A total of 11 people were detained following that terror attack, including those three gunmen who are shown here for those watching on television being taken for interrogation earlier today in the Russian capital. Russia has claimed they were attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. U.S. intelligence services believe the attack was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group known as ISIS-K. However, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has attempted to place some blame on Ukraine, an allegation that Kyiv has called absurd. Meanwhile, Ukraine is working to restore power supplies across the country after Russia's biggest attack of the war so far on Ukraine's power grid. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has said that more than 200,000 people in Kharkiv are still in the dark. It's after Russia pounded Ukrainian power facilities on Friday, striking the country's largest dam. That attack killed at least five people and put, the Euro put Europe's biggest nuclear station at risk. It comes as more than 30,000 civilians have so far been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Well, back here in the UK, the Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming that £100,000 a year is, he said, not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as people think for those in his Surrey constituency because of higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home in the UK now costs around eight times the average income. It was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini on GB News this morning that lower taxes will make a difference. House prices in that part of the world, £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch. And those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this mm. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full time, their income go up by £1,800. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to social cohesion. That's according to an independent government adviser. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published tomorrow, showing that more than 75% of the public feel that they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society has become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during one of their classes. 
It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. Well, we've heard today that China is believed to be targeting Britain with a wave of cyber attacks aimed at interfering with the upcoming general election. The Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to warn MPs tomorrow about escalating state-backed threats from Chinese hackers. MI5 has also revealed an exponential increase in their investigations into Chinese hacking activities. And it comes after a report found that Britain is unprepared for a large-scale ransomware attack due to what they've called a lack of investment. And finally, eight people have been rescued after their fishing boat sank off the coast of Shetland, triggering a major rescue effort. A lifeboat and two helicopters were scrambled to the scene after the 27-metre vessel activated its distress beacon this morning. It had started taking on water in rough seas and sank within just a matter of minutes. The call-out saved all of the crew on board who were safely airlifted from their life rafts and we understand they are reported to be in a good condition. That's it from me for now. I'll be back in the next hour. More coming up from Mark. But in the meantime, you can get all the latest breaking news by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. Thanks a million, Sam. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Busy one this evening. Are Reform UK a far-right party? And is the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, right to say that £100,000 is not a huge salary? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister, Anne Widdicombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. This evening, the leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton, former Labour special advisor, Paul Richards, and journalist and communications expert, Linda Jubilee. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros, a packed hour, lots to get through. Those papers are coming and Anne Widdicombe is waiting in the wings. But first, my take at 10. Now, the Tories are horribly divided at the moment, with scores of MPs plotting against their, in my view, underrated leader, Rishi Sunak. But don't be fooled, the Labour Party aren't exactly the Swiss family Robinson themselves. Angela Rayner, the deputy leader who still has unanswered questions about the sale of her council house, is at odds with her leader, Sir Keir Starmer, about whether Diane Abbott should return to the party. That's the same Diane Abbott who says that Jewish people don't experience racism. Meanwhile, Labour's longtime cheerleader, The Guardian's columnist Owen Jones, has torn up his party membership because Starmer is not as revolutionary as he would like. Labour backbenchers threatened a mutiny over Labour's pro-Israel stance, a major political embarrassment narrowly avoided by Starmer when he reportedly convinced the Speaker of the House of Commons to cancel the vote altogether. The Corbynites on the backbenches, of whom there are many more than Labour would like to admit, and the hardcore lefties out there in the country who are fast-tracked into the party after Ed Miliband's bonkers rule change on membership, are vocally unhappy with Starmer's plans. Starmer out regularly trends on Twitter, and that doesn't bode well. And Labour's more radical ideas are already an accident waiting to happen. Don't take my word for it. New Labour mastermind Peter Mandelson, speaking to the Sunday Times today, has voiced concerns about Labour plans to bolster union power and burden businesses with extra costs and red tape. Mandelson is urging Starmer to move more slowly. And here's why. Sakir Starmer has vowed to put forward drastic labour market reforms within the first 100 days of winning power. The policy platform being fronted by Angela Rayner, which should be a red flag in itself, would give all workers, that's right, all workers, employment rights from their first day in the job. Now, doesn't that sound lovely? Who would argue with that? But what it means in reality is that businesses could employ someone who's completely useless and be stuck with them. Companies will potentially have to use a four-stage process, then potentially an employment tribunal if someone was incompetent or even if they didn't turn up to work. Under those circumstances, companies 
will simply be reluctant to hire people in the first place. And what does that mean? More unemployment. You're welcome. Labour also want to end zero hours contracts for people who do casual work on unspecified days and for unspecified hours. Like a lot of ideas from Labour, this is well intention. It sounds great, doesn't it? Get rid of zero hour contracts. But the reality is that many people, including women with families and students, enjoy the informal nature of zero hours contract. It's an easy way to pick up a bit of work. I was on them for years. The flexibility is enjoyed by many, which is why so many people take advantage. If companies can't employ people casually, they'll just make do with the staff they've got. And what does that lead to? Yes, more unemployment and more people on benefits in a country that's already broke. And then there are enhanced rights for the trade unions, including 1970s style collective bargaining. Again, enhanced rights, stronger unions, it sounds lovely, but bear in mind how industrial action has crippled our railways, our health service and other sectors in recent months. And that is before Labour's reforms, which will inevitably lead to more strike chaos, which means disrupted lives and yet more economic damage. Enhanced union power will also lead to more government borrowing as Prime Minister Starmer is forced to grant unaffordable public sector wage settlements, a further consequence of which is inflation. It's all what can only be described as a potential perfect economic storm. But it doesn't stop there. What about the £15 national living wage? An idea that I'm sympathetic to. Of course, it sounds like a good idea. But what is the reality? Well, it will devastate businesses and jobs in sectors like hospitality, retail and social care. They're going to take on fewer people or go bust. I like policies that work, not policies that sound good. Now, I do believe that trade unions are of critical importance. Bosses will always try to rip off their workers, which is why all of the people watching and listening to this program should have professional support and protection. But it's a fine balance between workers' rights and a fair wage versus crippling businesses. Businesses that generate the national income for this country that pays for schools police officers and hospitals. Businesses who do us a great service by actually employing people. The public sector, bankrolled by the taxpayer, is already far too big, with many people doing nonsense jobs like diversity officers in the NHS. We need companies employing people, not the state. But these reforms under Labour threaten to make that less attractive. The Tories are in a chaotic state at the moment. But if so-called chaos means low unemployment, falling inflation, expected lower interest rates and modest economic growth with a government that stands up to the striking unions, well, I'll take that chaos. Thank you very much. The alternative is Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, who has tried to paint herself as the new Margaret Thatcher this week except that it was Margaret Thatcher that dismantled the out-of-control unions, not emboldened them. I'm not convinced by Labour's claims of moderation. New Labour, this lot ain't. Keir Starmer is no Tony Blair, a man that I voted for three times. And Rachel Reeves is no Margaret Thatcher. In fact, she's more Iron Curtain than Iron Lady. I did. I voted New Labour three times because they believed in low taxes. They were aspirational and they were so pragmatic. They actually kept the Tory spending plans in place in their first year in power. Why? Because Tory Chancellor Ken Clark did such a bloody good job. Anyway, uh, your reaction. Uh, let me know if you agree or disagree or somewhere in between. Mark at GBnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly. But first, tonight's top pundits, the leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton, former Labour special advisor, Paul Richards, and journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee. Linda, take it away. Well, I think that uh, Peter Mandelson is clearly an expert in um, political campaigning. He is quite right to sound a note of caution, especially since the Labour Party has what's called, I believe, a smoked salmon and scrambled egg offensive with the city.
Um, it, it is really, really important now because you've quite rightly pointed out the balance between cutting back and actually being sensible with some of these regulations. And that's the fine balance that anyone who takes power in the next um, administration will have to pay attention to. Mm. The fact is that zero hour con contracts aren't particularly popular with anyone. I've never heard anyone say they would rather be on a zero hour contract. Linda, and, they're uh, popular with all of the people that are on them, people that want to pick up casual work. Well, my kids have all wanted to pick up casual work and when they, before they got jobs and while they're in their holidays. But they don't regard it as a long-term um, ambition. Most people want the security of a job. Well, okay. How can you possibly raise a family? How can you possibly lay down some of the markers in your life if you are perpetually a casual labourer? I hear what you're saying, but that's not the purpose of zero hours contracts. I think they're brilliant because it's representative of a flexible labour market, Neil Hamilton, in which it's easy for companies to employ people. Of course, you're absolutely right. And uh, I'm on a zero hours contract as a barrister <laughs> and as a freelance journalist. Uh, you know, I haven't got a, a, a right to be paid. If I don't work, if I don't get contracts, then I'm out of a job, effectively. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, I've been working now for 50 years and I've had a formal contract of employment uh, for only five of those years. And I actually made a lot more money out of being self-employed than I would have done out of being on somebody, uh, some employer's mm -hmm. books. So I think th th this is a nonsense. Really. The gig economy, actually, is a great thing, so, uh, which you know, enables people to, to work for as long or as little as they like and also means that there are lots more people providing services than there would otherwise be. So, that, you know, the more restrictions you place upon taking people on and employing them, the fewer people, as you rightly say, will be employed. Uh, and that's pure, eco you know, sensible economics, isn't it? Uh, so the, the, the more we load costs on employers, it makes it m much more difficult to be flexible in the labour market, then the less efficient the economy is going to be and the poorer the whole country is going to be. So, yeah, back to the 1970s, it's a great election slogan, isn't it? Because the unions were so uh, productive uh, and, uh, and good for us, it then brought the country to, the, to its knees in the winter of discontent in 1979, and that was a Labour government. So, yeah, bring it on. Paul Richards, uh, in The Times today, Peter Mandelson, Labour's union reforms must not be rushed. They can't betray business. Well, we're not talking about barristers and journalists. We're talking about people who are working at Boots who are just waiting at home for the, a call to come so they can get some money together to pay the rent. Uh, and that's a... It's a, it's a but with, with no... Uh, Paul, sorry to interrupt you, Paul, briefly, but with no zero-hours contracts, then there's just no job rather than an occasional job. That's my point. No, they'll be better paid and more secure jobs, which will be something that everyone aspires and, to. And but there's fewer no, there's jobs. No do, you, between... do you acknowledge that with no zero hours, there will be fewer, better jobs? Well, this is the argument people like you advanced about the national minimum wage, wasn't it? Which we were told was going to cost a million jobs, and it didn't. It just made the people in work get better pay, which, of course, they then spend in local pubs and shops and restaurants, and it improves the economy. Very true. Not having low wages. So, That's uh, true. Peter Mandelson is right to say that we need to ease these in. There shouldn't be a burden on business, but Labour's positioning itself as being a pro-business and a pro-worker party. There's no reason why those two things can't be true. Uh, Paul, do we really want the unions to be more powerful, given the chaos we've seen in the civil service, the NHS, uh, college lecturers, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, the, the rail workers? I mean, we, we've well, had union chaos before giving the unions more power, which is what Starmer wants to do. I mean, there's only 6 million people in trade unions out of a workforce of about 30 million. That's enough million, to cripple the country, Paul. About 30 million, so most people are not in a union. But, I mean, the, the cover, as you said, you know, getting decent legal advice, getting good mm. uh, services in the workplace and having someone in there looking after you is a good thing. I'm a, I'm a member of a trade union, I'm glad I am, and, and you know, anyone watching this should consider joining one because they I, help I, Paul, the Paul, I'm going to let you into a secret. I'm, I'm secretly an admirer of Rachel Rees. My tongue was in my cheek about the, uh, the uh, what was it, the Iron Lady and, uh, and all the rest of it. But um, the truth is that she's made a lot of good noises. Uh, the OBR are going to sign off Labour's spending pledges. They're not going to splash the cash. They're not going to spend money they haven't got. So well done, Labour, and well done, Rachel Reeves. But is it not concerning that the architect of New Labour is having to write articles in the paper warning the Labour Party not to damage business? It's not a good look, is it, Paul? No, he's entitled to say it, and he's probably. But why is he right. saying it? 
Well, because he wants to set the tone of the Labour government that he thinks might be round the corner. And Rachel Reeves, as you say, is brilliant. By the way, Labour stuck to the Tory plans for three years, not just one. There you go. Brilliant stuff. Listen, I tell you what, maybe the country needs a change. Is it time? That's what the polls say. Uh, your thoughts, please. Mark at GBNews.com. My brilliant panel are back at 10.30 for all of tomorrow's papers. Uh, but next up, are Reform UK far right? And is 100 grand a huge amount of money? We'll debate that with Anne Whittacombe next. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. New framework from the Department of Transport is making sure that people will have a say on whether LTNs are introduced. So councils are going to have to really find out whether residents in an area actually want them or not. Let's talk to uh, <laughs> former racing driver and motoring journalist uh, Amanda Stretton. Amanda, good to see you. I'm surprised that councils were introducing them without any sort of consultation already, to be honest. I know. It's an absolute mystery, isn't it? Because um, certainly in the area that I live, the um, implement, which is in Oxford, the implementation of the low traffic neighbourhoods has been, I mean, the report that we've seen today talks about um, the, the, the challenge that emergency services are getting, are, are having, getting to people who actually need them. It's also impacting um, all the local businesses because people are being forced onto these main arterial routes. Those routes are now absolute gridlock. And what's been happening is these low traffic um, neighbourhoods have been decided by people who don't live in the area. They don't understand the way traffic moves, um, the times of day. And it has therefore just led to absolute chaos. So it makes perfect sense that um, if these schemes are going to be introduced, they're actually introduced with the support of the people who it's going to affect. Well, that, and that's going to be problematic, don't you think? Because um, once everybody has talked it, discussed it, most residents are not going to want it. I think you've got to understand, you know, if the vast majority of people are rejecting the proposal of a, of a scheme that's due to be implemented, you've really got to question the viability and the sense in doing so. We want to encourage people to cycle, absolutely, but actually by causing um, these, these huge congested blocks, these arteries, I really don't think that that's uh, necessarily the way forward. I'm Michelle Jubery. And I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Is mental health a cult and an industry? The emails are coming in thick and fast. I'll get to them at 10.30 with the papers. But first up, the BBC has apologised to Reform UK after calling it far right in a news report. The corporation made the claim during a report about the Liberal Democrats' spring conference. Although reform is arguably to the right of the Tory party on certain issues like legal and illegal immigration and the tax burden, it has always stated its political aims are not motivated by political ideology. But were the BBC right or wrong to use this label? Are Reform UK far right? Let's speak to former government minister and Reform UK supporter, arguably other than Nigel, their most high profile supporter, Anne Whittacombe. Anne, are Reform UK far right? No, it's a nonsense. I mean, if when you get a common sense party that is is just saying uh, a lot of things that a lot of people agree with and want actually to see done rather than just talked mm. about, if you immediately say, ah, far right. Uh, and of course, I know exactly why they're saying that. It's not because of our policies on anything except immigration. Mm. And the instant you start talking about immigration and the need to control it and what you might do to control it, at that point, Everybody says, or you're far right, or whatever it might be. 
Um, and that is just a nonsense. Far right, I mean, far left is communist. Uh, far right is fascist. Um, we are not, believe it or not, fascist. Glad to hear it. Um, Reform UK has ditched an election candidate, Anne, after claims emerged that he fantasised about deporting millions of British citizens to get rid of, and I quote, the foreign plague we've been diseased with. Is this the kind of person that Reform UK is attracting? Well, uh, obviously, we move very, very fast indeed uh, to remove that candidate, um, and uh, that was the right thing to do. Um, all parties get rogue candidates, all parties, and all parties are embarrassed both during elections and just during ordinary parliaments uh, by something that a candidate says. That is not our view, um, and uh, that is why we removed the candidate. And we didn't mess about, you know, it was done immediately. And uh, I find you among the most persuasive political commentators in the country. That's why we love having you on the show every Sunday night. You're the jewel in the crown of Mark Dolan tonight every Sunday. And I think that the policy platform of Reform UK is based on common sense and rather attractive. But aren't Reform a bit like the Liberal Democrats of old? They can say anything because they're never going to win power. Well, no. I mean, we produce a, a very carefully costed uh, set of measures. Um, very carefully costed, so nobody can say we can't do it. Um, but uh, your point is, you know, we're never going to get power. Well, um, it's time for change. You yourself said so just now. You know, you were talking about the Labour Party. But actually, it's time for change in a much bigger sense. It's mm. time to get rid of this idea that you must vote for one of the two main parties. It's time for that sort of change, because they're both useless. Uh, and that is why reform is now um, attracting... Uh, a large numbers of members, and why reform is now very steadily climbing the pole. Most definitely. But, Anne, going back to the fantasy politics argument, um, how are Reform UK going to stop the boats should they win power? Is it uh, Richard Tice in a naval uniform on a frigate turning the boats back himself? Well, that's a wonderful thought. My father was in the Navy, so that's a pretty good thought. But, no, uh, of course, that's not what we're uh, planning to do. Look at what Australia did and look at what Belgium did. People tend to forget Belgium. Um, and the answer is that what you do is you intercept the boats and you take the occupants of the boats back to where they came from, which in, in this case is France. Um, and by the time you've set off and had to go back, you know, um, several times, you've run out of money. You're no longer able to pay the tracking agent. Uh, so that is the first thing. But the second thing is, OK, some will still get through. They will be held in secure reception centres, not hotels where they can come and go and disappear, in secure reception centres so that we can process them quickly and again take them back uh, if we're going to um, refuse their claim. And a um, lot of focus... By the way, in case you're wondering, let mm. me just stress this. International law already allows us to do that. It allows us to intercept and turn people back who are entering our waters illegally. It allows us to. And let me add that I'm sure Richard Tice looks excellent in a naval uniform. He's got the shoulders for it. But, Anne, um, Reform UK, uh, you're very tired of this question, is a vote for Reform UK a vote for the Tories? And I understand your frustration. That was the argument for UKIP and the Brexit party. Uh, so let's look at it from the other side. Are Reform UK also a threat to Labour? Oh, I think we're becoming an increasing threat to Labour um, because uh, the Red Wall very much share our values, very much. And your ordinary Labour voter who wouldn't actually touch the Tories with a 10-foot barge pole uh, now has an option. He has the option of reform, which is speaking his or her language. So uh, I think, yes, we are a very big threat to Labour. Uh, and over the coming months, that will become more manifest. I mean... It's inevitable that you concentrate on the government to start with, because after all, they're in charge. They're the ones making a mess of it. Uh, but now that Labour is um, you know, coming up with policies and all the rest of it, we should be more focused on Labour. So, yes, uh, we're a threat to both, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, but that threat will not turn into reality unless people have the guts to vote for change. And that's what I would say to people. If you really want change, find your courage and vote for it. Now, Anne, I'm getting a bit frustrated with politicians being hung out to dry 
for saying uncontroversial things that are true. Uh, your reaction to the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who has defended his comments in an interview when he said that £100,000 is not a huge amount of money. It isn't, is it? By the time you've paid your mortgage, your childcare, your tax, uh, bloody piano lessons for the kids, you name it, life ain't cheap anymore. Is 100000 a huge amount of money? No, it's not. I mean, quite clearly, you know, it, it would seem like a million to some people who are on uh, very low wages. Uh, but the fact is that some GPs earn that. You know, the head of a large comprehensive will earn that. In the private sector and industry, lots and lots of people will earn that. It's no longer, um, you know, it's something that you can't aspire to. So, uh, no, I, I don't think it's a huge salary. It's certainly a very comfortable one, but it's not a huge salary. And I look forward to seeing you in a week's time. My thanks to the formidable ex-government minister and broadcaster, Anne Whitaker. Next up, the papers, some hot headlines. See you in two. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quieter day weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday. But low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of that rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching uh, average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Just gone 10.30, time for this. Front page of the Daily Telegraph, China and Russia behind slurs on the princess. Whitehall sources warned that disinformation online may be used to destabilise society, including vicious online rumours about the Princess of Wales. A majority of private schools will raise fees if Labour bring in VAT raid and free speech threats from climate of censorship. The Sun newspaper... Uh, government to punish cyber raid, China hack attack on the UK. Chinese hackers 
accessed the personal details of 40 million UK voters in an assault on our democracy, according to an exclusive report in The Sun. The Guardian suspects appear in court accused of Moscow attack that left 137 dead and NHS exodus as overseas nurses seek higher pay. The Times, Beijing blamed for malign cyber attack on election watchdog. Uh, Catherine inspired to speak out by reaction to the King's cancer. And Russell Group gets most of its fees from overseas. Of course, those are the top universities in the UK. UK students now account for less than 25% of some leading institutions' income. Metro, £14 billion, pounds, United Kindom. Generous people gave a record £13.98 billion pounds to charity last year, with some of the UK's least well-off places the most generous. And the Daily Star. We are tops for treasure. Daily Star joins the gold rush. Hunt for £4 billion in sunken ship. Your Daily Star has joined the hunt for a sunken galleon packed with gold worth £4 billion. Pounds. If our pirate finds the treasure, we'll all get shipwrecked, promise the Daily Star. Brilliant stuff. Uh, listen, I've got some great emails coming in. Uh, let me just uh, catch up on that because we were just discussing whether mental health has become a cult, an industry. Uh, this from Jess. Hi, Mark. After struggling with mental health issues for decades, I've only recently found out the reason why, and that was from a private diagnosis. My GP only prescribed countless antidepressants, which address the symptoms, not the cause. Now I'm unable to work and sadly rely on benefits. The mental health system in this country is appalling and needs a complete overhaul. Love the show, says Jess. Jess, thank you for that. And my heart goes out to you for what you're going through. Uh, Brigitte, uh, hi, Mark. Too many young people have never been taught resilience. They've been mollycoddled all through the school years. Uh, Sarah says, uh, we've been told we need to think about our mental health. People need to stop dwelling on it and get on with life. Too much mollycoddling, which means people don't face up to life and therefore don't build resilience. Yes, it can be hard, but face up to things and life's challenges will be easier. And uh, look, I'll catch up, but we do have a lot more of those emails to come. Um, how about uh, this? OK, we'll finish on this because it's a really good email about mental health. And it's from Russ. Good evening, Russ. How are you? Uh, Russ says, yes, people are playing the system because it's easy to stay at home and claim benefits. We are confusing stress with mental health. I was an RAF fighter pilot. It was a very stressful job, but we all got on with coping. I think we're suffering from a snowflake attitude by many. Uh, Russ, thank you for that. If you're having mental health issues, it is of critical importance that you do reach out. You've got Samaritans, online resources, places you can call, and you've got your GP. But I think the point about resilience is one worth reflecting on. OK, reaction to the big stories of the day with my top pundits this evening. We have the leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton. Former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards and journalist and communications expert Linda Jubilee. Uh, folks, lots of front pages to sink our teeth into. Uh, and what about this? China and Russia behind slurs on the princess. Now, I don't want Linda Jubilee Absolutely. to focus on Catherine because she's recovering. She's got a serious yeah. diagnosis. Uh, but this is about foreign powers that are such a great threat to our democracy yeah. and as we're seeing in this uh, story a threat to our society yeah and i think it's incredibly likely that some of this activity has happened mm. it's already happened in the past we know it's happened we know that china has um, has hacked into people's accounts i think it hacked into at one stage the tech correspondent of the ft and surveilled her family and friends shocking and that's all gone before still at least she had some readers for a change <laughs> they've got plenty of the right readers mark of course they they've do. got an optimum i'm only kidding they've I'm got sure an I'll optimum be... circulation <laughs> See, i'm sure i'll be writing for the pink paper at some point <laughs> right but i think this is absolutely <laughs> true and when you think about what people said about the king and the princess being, you know, the two most fundamentally important and charismatic figures of the royal family. If you're thinking about destabilising a country, those are two of the people you'd pick on first. Well, indeed, and more of the same in the sun, Paul Richards. China hack attack on the UK. Uh, Chinese hackers um, access the personal details of 40 million UK voters in an assault on our democracy. This has been a concern in America as well. Mm. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a major worry, isn't it? 
isn't it? It really is a worry because it's mm. quite easy to do, it would seem. And yeah. they obviously don't support our democracy and they want to undermine us and they want to spread disinformation and they want yeah. to do their fake mm. videos and mm. the AI and all this stuff. And it just sort of means that we can't really trust what we're seeing and hearing online anymore. And, of course, there are people in China and Russia that want us to be discombobulated, confused... And divided. Yep. D divided and not vote. i tell you one thing. I, I was a foreign correspondent in Hong Kong and therefore covered China for five years. Mm. Chinese refer to themselves as the Middle Kingdom. They mean that they're between us, we're down here on Earth, and heaven. They're the Middle Kingdom. Chonghua in Mandarin, China, Middle Kingdom. They do not play by the same rules as the rest of us. That's pretty Actually, chilling. Actually, mindset-wise, culturally-wise, mm. you know, maybe I'm being a little bit too outspoken. Yeah. Be outspoken. This is Mark Dolan tonight. There we That's are. your job. But it's true that, you know, the world of the internet is awash with conspiracy theories mm. and disinformation. Um, yeah, we can't re rely on the Chinese government. We can't even rely on our own government. I know, it's course, prime territory. They are everyone. producing disinformation, as we saw during COVID, effectively. Mm. Um, um, most of what the government said was a load of rubbish with no scientific basis at all. The whole global warming debate is, is riddled with this as well. Well, during COVID, we had the six... Was it the six-metre rule? The three-metre yeah. rule? Yeah. Two metres. I've forgotten how many metres metres it was now. Mm. But men always make it longer, don't they? Well, uh, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> as you need two metres. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Ask Mrs Dolan. Um, the two-metre rule, the COVID... That, that, didn't come from anywhere. No. That was just dreamt up by behavioural scientists. Exactly. And, uh, uh, Although so... you mentioned the climate hoax, I mean, the majority of uh, climate scientists believe that the planet's heating up and needs to be dealt with. Absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, science is well, not a well, democracy anyway. But what, what do you mean by climate scientists to start with? Mm. There's, well, Experts there's in their field? Two, <laughs> there are one or two self-serving studies of this that have been made by mm. propagandists. And from that, they say 97% of, uh, of climate scientists um, uh, agree. But, but who needs the true. Chinese government when we've got Neil Hamilton? Well, who is I... spreading misinformation <laughs> and nonsense I, I amongst the populace? If Xi Jinping wants to make me his deputy, I'm, I'm up for the job. He'll be straight <laughs> over there, won't you? Um, what what about you, this, uh, this story, Paul Richards? Does it mm. concern you? Free speech is a threat... Uh, sorry, free speech under threat from climate or censorship. Uh, this is the Home Affairs editor of the Daily Telegraph. Free speech is being threatened by dangerous climate oh, harassment yes. and censorship. Uh, Dame uh, Sarah Khan yeah. Yeah. identified the rise of freedom-restricting harassment in a report highlighting threats to the UK's social cohesion, saying that not just politicians but also individuals were being subjected to rape and death threats, abuse and hatred to silence them and prevent them from expressing their That's views. Shocking. You could but mention, couldn't I, Paul, J.K. Rowling, who's had death threats, yeah, rape goes, threats, for, for pointing out basic human biology. It goes back to this idea of social media, which has created a climate whereby people yeah. can say and do these things online. Yeah. But the danger is, you know, it's now spreading into real life. So people are demonstrating outside of schools and yeah. shouting That's each other terrible. in town centres and these sorts of things, and, you know, Gaza and, and this issue is sort of exacerbated. That, that report's out tomorrow, and, yeah. uh, and also it focuses on Batley Grammar School, doesn't it, where yeah. there was the big yeah. um, protest. That, that teacher is still in hiding well, and under disgrace. threat and Absolute his family. Disgrace. It's a total disgrace what's well, gone on there. It's a failure of the rule of law in this country, is it Absolutely. not? It's completely failed because the, the police don't actually uh, provide any... Oh, West Yorkshire police for people. Uh, have been accused of doing so little to support the family. Uh, and you know, the government has done nothing about all the problems which have been spawned by the Equalities Act, which mm. a lot of this diversity nonsense uh, spreads outwards. Uh, and freedom of speech has not been protected properly in universities, academic institutions, or indeed even in, in business uh, and employment uh, conditions where uh, people live under a self-censorship now about what they can and can't say, which is actually more sinister in many ways than government laying down the law to say you can't do things. Well, social cohesion needs activity, not words. We yeah. don't need any more words and any more reports unless we respond directly to the recommendations of the report. But what we've got to look at I is quite like cohesion. the idea of a ban on demos outside the yeah, school absolutely. gates. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's no excuse, or no excuse for, that for it at all. Well, most definitely. In the old days, of course, the, the police would have come in and clear them off. Yeah, but they uh, don't. Because uh, it's an, obviously an offence to harass and to inspire feelings of fear in people. Mm. What was the purpose of the demonstration? It is actually to try to force people 
to yeah. do what And similarly, Neil, are you concerned by developing story that was covered by Sam in the headlines there, that the British Museum, which is arguably the, the most famous museum on planet Earth, had to close early today because of Palestinian protesters? Well, why are the police... Why are they bearing them off? I mean, that, that's what the police should be doing. I mean, under the, under the Highways Act, you know, it's not lawful to have demonstrations. Mm. Is it time. because the cops are outnumbered? Linda. I don't think they're outnumbered, but what I want to know is why are those demonstrators outside the British Museum? Well, because of BP so subsidised, uh, uh, giving £50 million pounds to, to the British Museum. We had a, oh. a, a, a council meeting in Hastings this week that uh, was uh, broken up by pro-Palestinian demonstrators. They got one and a half minutes into their agenda before the meeting had to be stopped. What was Hastings Council got to do with Gaza? Yeah. Exactly. Nothing. It's too, too right. Uh, well, listen, folks, lots more to come. More front pages uh, to come. Plus, my pundits will nominate their headline heroes and back page zeros. And here's something worth staying up for. We're going to hear about a theatre that has instructed white members of the audience to check their privilege at the door. It's a wild story, and one of my favourite comedians has stayed up late on his holiday to tell us all about it. That's next. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night. You're going to be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very quick shout out to uh, James and Josh and Sophia who worked so hard on the show today and particularly Mescana who has just attacked it working so hard doing such a brilliant job. So thank you Mescana, James and the team for working so hard. This show is nothing without the viewers, the listeners 
and the team the other side of the camera. Uh, more front pages, and let's have a look at the mirror now. Um, battle for the boozer. Pubs call time at 8 p.m. Beleaguered boozers now shut as early as 8 o'clock as drinkers stay at home. Publicans have cut their opening hours to save on staff and energy bills as the cost of living crisis reduces custom. That's devastating. Uh, William, in awe of Kate's coverage, courage in the uh, mirror, is the other story there. Uh, the Express... And how about this? Uh, Chancellor, we will keep triple lock for the whole of the next parliament and King's Easter message of unity and hope to the nation. Uh, King Charles will rally the nation with a powerful Easter message of hope and unity this coming week. And don't we need that? Well, I've got a great story for you now. The Telegraph newspaper's Charlotte Gill reports that white audience members attending a comedy show at an Arts Council-funded venue are being asked to check their privilege at the door. Showing at the Soho Theatre in London, the Femme of Colour Comedy Club is billed as an unapologetic celebration of comedians of colour that are not cis men. Attendees are told white audience members are encouraged to check their privilege at the door. Well, joining me now is comedian Quincy, uh, who, let me tell you, is a regular on Headliners, but he's on holiday in Barbados tonight. Quincy, a comedian. Is this progress? What do you think of this story? Um, well, when I first heard it, um, I actually thought to myself, is that a new word for tickets? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought it was. <laughs> is that new, the, new, the new word for tickets? But yeah. Um, I thought to myself, you know what, um, female comedians of colour, all different shades, um, isn't a bad thing because you don't get a lot of females. But look, I'm just saying to my white, my, my white family members, how long is this show? What, an hour and a half? You can't sit in the back seat or the back of the, the theatre for at least an hour and a half and take in the vibes. Yeah, that's, 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 that's just my perspective of it. Um, I, I think that comedy is for all shapes and sizes and all minds. And I do believe that, especially in that space, everybody should experience what people are talking about. Mm. And if you are a true performer, um, you will embrace and you will deliver your material for a wider audience to understand. So if it's for white people to check their privilege, if that means white people leave that theatre feeling that they have to donate towards reparations, then... <laughs> <laughs> then bring it on. I mean, the thing is, you're a top comedian yourself. Uh, you don't go around dividing up your audience, do you? You just want to make the people in front of you laugh. But my main important thing is I want to see the ticket sales, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you're purple, you're orange, or you're blue, as long as you understand my sense of humour, I want to make people laugh. Regardless of your background, regardless of where you're from, yeah. I want to make people laugh. And we are, we are living in times where... I think it's very decisive that you should tell people what kind of audience should come to your show. An audience member will come to your show if your material is open and honest and they find a bit about you, they will come to your show regardless. And then well, we I see totally, that with I, I, I totally agree. Uh, you, you, you know, you don't care if the audience are orange, yellow or blue. It does help if they've had a drink, though, doesn't it? Well, I don't know about you, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I like my oldest to be sober. <laughs> no, <laughs> to mine... be honest, you know, until they can take it. No, mine, mine yeah, need a few stellars. Mine need a few stellars. Yeah, uh, stay baby, with us, Quincy, and I appreciate you interrupting your glamorous holiday to join us uh, on the show. Uh, let's bring in my pundits for their views on this. Linda Jubilee, Paul Richards and Neil Hamilton. Uh, Linda, your reaction to this story. Uh, white audience members, check your privilege at the door. Do you know, I've done stand-up comedy yeah. and I've had to get on stage as, as a white woman and, and make a whole crowd of people laugh and it's bloody hard work and I don't think it matters what colour you are, the performer or the audience, there's two things here and Quincy's pointed them out. Can he make people laugh and can he sell tickets? Totally agree with him. Also, I mean, maybe there was a joke being made here, Paul. I mean, perhaps we're, you know, the Telegraph are not seeing the funny side. I think they were making a really important point. I mean, I, I love the Soho Theatre. The last thing I saw there was actually conducted entirely in British Sign Language, uh, which was, a, you know, a breakthrough performance, translated, thank heavens, because I don't speak BSL. But, you know, it's not that long since comedians in this country were big, fat blokes in northern working-class clubs and making mm. racist mm. jokes. So, you know, you do need to keep the pushing the boundaries, and that's what I think the Soho theatre is all about.
Although, Neil, I think some people will be offended by this. Uh, wasn't it Martin Luther King who said, judge me by my character, not the colour of my skin? Exactly. I mean, the only colour that you should be interested in if you're in a theatre is the colour of the audience's money. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've been to the Soho Theatre. In fact, there was a play at the Soho, Th Soho Theatre once about Christine and me, uh, in, our, in our own words, actually. Not that we wrote it, but uh, taken from one of the great court dramas that have littered our lives. Um, <laughs> sadly, the, uh, yeah. sadly, the play didn't have a long run, but, but uh, there it is. Now, I think you know, it's a lot of nonsense and white privilege. I don't know what privilege I had. Um, everything I've got, uh, I've made uh, as a result of uh, Christine bringing me up in the right way. I, I know you spent most of it on bow ties. A uh, couple of seconds left. Quincy, how's your holiday going in Barbados? Well, it's, it's a part holiday and it's a part from a, mem a memory of my father, who oh. I've brought back his ashes. So I'm here to show respect to his birthplace. Um, and um, I've got some families from around the world to come in. So, yeah, I'm out here taking a break. And DB News, the last time I was on, it paid me so well, I paid for my ticket first class. <laughs> Worth every penny. Listen, God bless your dad and God bless you, Quincy. We'll catch up soon. Quincy, the comedian there, I'm no doubt returning to headliners in the weeks ahead. Uh, listen, the clock's against us. It's been such a busy show. I wish we had time for the headline heroes and back page zeros, but it's been one of those days. Uh, what can I say? I've loved the last three shows. So much enjoy your company, listening on the radio, watching on the box. I return on uh, actually after Easter. I won't see you next weekend. Have a great Easter and I'll see you the week after. Headliners is next. warm feeling inside from boxed boilers sponsors of weather on gb news hello here's your latest weather update from the met office for gb news we saw a quieter day weather wise